about one o'clock. So let's get started. Um, we really like it, J-Pro, to start on time as much as possible. Um, I'll leave the quote up for another minute um, while I just do a quick introduction of myself and J-Pro, first of all. My name is Erica Goldman. I'm the Director of Program and Operations at J-Pro Network, which is the resource organization for all of, by, and for all those professionals who work for the Jewish nonprofit sector in North America, um, meaning in the United States and Canada. We are here to support via networking and convenings and master classes. And we have a program called Well Advised, which is like really smart, just Jewish professional advice from people who've been there. Um, this program is from our, our program collection called JPro Online, where we just have terrific conversations with really smart people talking about things that are relevant to our work. Um, so I'm so delighted to welcome you to hear all along um, our conversation with author Sarah Horowitz and Abby Saloma. Um, very quick introduction, and you can say more yourselves if you'd like. Um, but I'll say first, you know, first a lawyer and later speech writer for such small fish as Hillary Clinton during her <laughs> presidential primary campaign for President Obama during his 2008 campaign. Uh, Sarah was a White House speechwriter from 2009 to 2017, starting out as senior speechwriter for President Barack Obama, and then serving as head speechwriter for First Lady Michelle Obama. Um, I think a lot of us want to hear some reflections on those experiences <laughs> for sure. Sarah is also a member of Cohort 5 of the Schusterman Fellowship, which is a highly selective leadership development program. Um, and of course, she's most recently the author of Here All Along. We're so pleased to be able to be in conversation with you today. And we're also joined by Abby Saloma, who as the Senior Director of Leadership and Talent at the Charles and Lynn Schusterman Family Foundation, she oversees the Schusterman Fellowship Program. Her work is really focused on developing and supporting leaders who are leading change in the Jewish sector and beyond. So we're going to start with a little conversation between Abby and Sarah. We're going to have a chance to reflect on ourselves how the book relates to us, how it might relate to our work and to our communities. Um, we'll get a chance to be in small groups so that some of you can get to meet each other. Um, and with that, I'm really delighted to turn it over to Abby and Sarah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Erica. Mm -hmm. um, thank you to the whole JPRO team uh, for this opportunity to be in conversation with Sarah, which I'm so excited about. And I'll just um, kick us off by saying, Many of us have heard some version of this headline, a bad breakup sent Michelle Obama's speechwriter down to the path. <laughs> but I wanted, to, I wanted to dive in the subtext of that a little bit. So my first question for you, Sarah, is how did you get to be Michelle Obama's speechwriter in the first place? So first of all, I just wanna say thank you so much, Abby. Thanks so much to everyone at JPro. I'm so excited to be doing this. Jewish educators and Jewish professionals, you are my people. I just, I am such a big fan of what you're doing. And I just, it's a really an honor to be here and to be able to do this, so thank you. So yeah, I, you know, hearing my bio read out loud, it sounds very like neat and linear and that's just not true. Like no one in politics has a linear orderly career that's just a bunch of successes. Um, I started out as an intern for Vice President Al Gore's speechwriters in the summer of 98. The folks that I worked for, they helped me get my first two jobs in speech writing, both of which were total, total failures. Um, my, my second boss, who was actually told me, you should go to law school. You're really just not working out as a speech writer, which I did. My third week of law school, I happened to meet a guy named Josh Gottheimer, who's now a congressman, but he had been a speech writer for President Clinton before law school. We started freelance writing together during law school, and he got me jobs on a couple of campaigns for Wes Clark and then for John Kerry in 2003, 2004. They both lost. Uh, I got a job as Hillary Clinton's speechwriter in 2008. She too lost. So I just want to just stop and clarify that this is two failed jobs and three losing campaigns at this point. Um, the Obama campaign happened to hire me, which was incredibly kind of them <laughs> given my record, and he won. And I, I met Mrs. Obama on that campaign in 08. And when we went to the White House, I was writing for President Obama, but I, I miss writing for her. And so in a somewhat surprising White House career move, I think it was surprising to President Obama as well. I moved over to becoming Mrs. Obama's chief speechwriter, which was just a joy. She's just someone who knows who she is and always knows what she wants to say. And 
I just, she was a delight. Writing for her was just such, it was always a challenge because she has such high standards, but it was incredibly rewarding, especially because she's just, she's so fun. Like the woman you see on TV is the woman I saw in the office uh, every day. And it was really an honor. So that is the, the winding and not particularly linear story of how I got to be a speechwriter in the White House. Great. And I think that, I mean, you said that political careers are seldom linear. And I think that resonates for a lot of us on this call as well. Many of our careers are um, take a winding, a winding path as well. And certainly the, um, the piece about failure, I think also really resonates mm. um, certainly with me and probably with folks on this call. So yeah. why on earth did you write a book about Judaism? <laughs> Yeah, you don't think that's just the logical next step. I mean, I, I think it's pretty linear. <laughs> so I, you know, I grew up maybe like some of you on the call. Um, Judaism for me was just too dull and comprehensible. High holy day services and a very long and boring Seder. And, you know, once I had my bat mitzvah, I just thought like, I'm free. You know, I don't, you know, I'm Jewish by heritage. I'm, I'm culturally Jewish, but I don't have to actually do this. Right? If I want meaning and connection and community and spirituality, obviously I'll have to look elsewhere because it's certainly not in those three points a year of connection with Judaism. Fast forward 25 years, I broke up with this guy I was dating, as Abby said, and I was really lonely and really anxious and I just had a lot of time on my hands and I happened to hear about an intro to Judaism class at the local JCC and I swear it could have been a ceramics class. It could have been a karate class. I was at this point very desperate to not be alone in my apartment. And so I signed up. And I think I just want to pause here because I think a lot of people try to impose what I think is a very Christian narrative on my experience, which is you were in crisis and then you found faith and then you were saved. And that's not true, right? I, I, was, I was lonely. I was pretty unhappy, but I just needed something to do. And I found this class and it wasn't like, oh my gosh, I'm saved. Everything's different. What it was instead was actually this realization of like, wow, where was this my whole life? Right, like we start in this class, we studied Jewish ethics. We studied the actual spiritual and moral underpinnings of Shabbat. We learned about different Jewish conceptions of the divine. And I just thought like, where has this been all my life? I, I didn't know this was Judaism. Like this was, it was edgy and radical and intellectual and subversive and very moving, very like emotional and spiritual. I just, I couldn't believe this. So. After that class, I took another intro class. I read hundreds of books. I started attending silent Jewish meditation retreats, which many people don't believe are a thing, but they are. Jews are silent the entire week, which is, it's hard for them. They struggle, but they, they, do, they do it just barely. Um, and you know what I found was that learning about Judaism was the second hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, it was just, I found that the books out there, there are some really great like nuts and bolts intro, intro books that, that do a good job of teaching the basics. But I'm, you know, I, I'm still kind of a little skeptical about not just how to do this, but like why to do this. You know, what what's the deeper stuff? And to find that, there were all these really sophisticated, very oftentimes academic books that I just found really tough to read. You know, I was pretty motivated, and even I, I found these books kind of a challenge because they're really kind of almost written for other academics. And what I was struggling with was like, I kept asking myself like, where is the book I need now? A book that covers the basics, right? That, that kind of gives you enough background to kind of really learn deeply, but also gets into that deeper stuff. And so I thought like, okay, maybe, you know, I'm a writer, maybe, oh, could I write it? And I thought, no, no, I'm not, I'm not a scholar. I'm not a rabbi. Who am I to do this? Right? It's not, that's not appropriate. But a friend of mine finally convinced me to do it. And I got an agent, I got the book deal. And then I discovered why this kind of book isn't commonly written because it's really hard. You know, so the first hardest professional thing I've ever done was writing this book. It was mind-bogglingly challenging. I mean, even just the phrase, like the rabbis said, it's like, oh, okay, cool. Who are the rabbis? Oh, right. Okay. In the year 70, when the Romans destroyed the temple, it's like, sorry, the temple, what, what are you talking about? Oh, right. Sorry. Okay. So we used, Jews used to sacrifice animals to worship God at a large temple in Jerusalem. It's like, whoa, sorry. Why were we doing that? Oh, sorry. The Torah says that it's like, I'm sorry, I don't, act, I don't know what the Torah is, right? It's the thing on the scrolls, it's the front of the sanctuary, but I don't, I don't know what it is. Is it like, who, who wrote it? Is that where the rules of all Judaism are? Is the book that I'm holding in my hand, is that like a small font version of the Torah? Which was something I, I a perfectly reasonable question to ask, which I, I actually did ask six years ago. So I think that having to give people just enough context to understand the phrase the rabbi said 
took me two chapters and that was, it was a real challenge. So yeah, I, I, you know, I'm very glad I did it, but Judaism in so many ways resists translation, right? It, it resists being written about in clear, accessible languages. Cause I think any sentence I wrote, I could immediately think of 10 counter argument sentences and you really do have to sometimes sacrifice precision for clarity, never accuracy, but sometimes precision. And that's really not what Judaism wants, right? There's, we're always trying to be more precise and get into more weeds. So I think that was a real challenge. Mm. So what does your, like, your life look like now? Like, how is it different? Um, particularly, like, how is it different Jewishly as well? Yeah, it's so different now. You know, it's, it's interesting. There are, I think, a few ways that I would I would answer that question. First of all, I think it's different in terms of my ethical foundations. You know, when I started learning about Judaism, I would have said like, sorry, I don't need religion to be a good person. I I'm a good person, which of course I am, but I'm not, studying Jewish ethics made me realize I'm, I'm not really a great person, right? Like there was just a much higher bar than the bar to which I was holding myself. You know, when I started studying Jewish ethics around how we use our speech every day, I found that very sobering. Right, like just all of the thinking around gossip, all the thinking around shaming people just felt like busted, right? You know, I don't think of myself as a gossiper, as a shamer, but I, I realized how oftentimes in, in conversation when I'm you know, in a debate with someone, I do sometimes kind of want to make them look bad, right? I do kind of want to almost like, there is almost an impulse to kind of humiliate someone or kind of put them down to show that you've got the better point. It's like, I don't think that's necessary, right? Studying all this thinking around that was sobering as was just gossip. You know, you think about how how much of my daily conversation was sharing gossip. I thought like, wow, I need to think more carefully about this. Um, I think also all the thinking around chesed, right? That's such a high bar demanding a real ministry of presence from us, right? Demand, it says like when someone's sick or in mourning, don't just send them a text, like get your body to them, right? Be with them physically. And I thought, oh gosh, I am the person who oftentimes sends a text or sends flowers and maybe I should think more about that. So I, you know, I still think I'm nowhere near meeting that bar. And I, I don't think any of us are, right? It's, it's an aspiration, not an end. But I think that really changed how I walk in the world. I also just think spiritually, you know, I really was someone who thought, okay, I looked at this prayer book twice a year, and it seems to indicate that God is a man in the sky who controls everything and rewards us when we're good and punishes us when we're bad. And I just don't believe it. Didn't believe it then, don't believe it now. So I guess I'm, I'm an atheist, right? That, that's, or maybe I'm like spiritual, but not religious. And that's fine, but those aren't the choices in Judaism, right? Just to, to discover that God, Judaism has all of these different divine conceptions, right? Like the idea that God is everything. You're God, I'm God. You know, that, that homeless man I walk by in the street, that man is God, right? That man is a manifestation of the divine. Like what a shift in, in thinking. Or, you know, God is what happens in two people who are in deep human relation with each other, fully contemplating each other's humanity, what arises between them is God. Or the idea that God is the process by which we become our highest, truest selves. I've just cited the Jewish mystics, Martin Buber, and Mordecai Kaplan. These are all legitimate Jewish conceptions of God that I, I had no idea existed. And I think now for me, you know, I'm still trying to figure this out, right? I don't, we don't do systemic theology in Judaism, which I love, because I think it reflects a real humility. We're saying like, we don't have a dogma of the divine. It's, it's, it's beyond us. It's something we can perceive in glimmers and glimpses and fleeting moments. And so for me, I think my life now is filled with more wonder and more daily awe and, and appreciation and openness. And that it was, it's like um, a rabbi friend of mine described it as a seventh sense. It's sort of like an added dimension to life. And I, you know, I'm closer to it sometimes, further away from it most of the time, but it's, it's something that's now there. And I think that the silent Jewish meditation retreats I attend have been a really big part of that. So I think that's, that's a big part. So I think ethics, spirituality, and finally community. You know, I don't have a community maybe in a traditional sense of how one would think of as like a synagogue community, but you know, I do have a community in the sense that I've just, I've, I've encountered now oftentimes through the Schusterman programs I've done, thank you to Schusterman, these, this incredible group of folks who are kind of wrestling with the same thing as I am, right? What does the Jewish future look like? How do we walk in the world as, as good and committed Jews? Whatever that means for all of us, right? It's so diverse. 
I've made so many friends and found so many fellow travelers and they are now a big part of my life. So I think those are the probably the main ways in which this has changed me. Mm. Something is really sticking with me um, that you said earlier, and it was the question, who am I to write this book? Mm. And I want to just give a little bit of a snapshot um, about my own personal story and lead into my next question. Yeah. So I'm from Reading, Pennsylvania, not a thriving Jewish metropolis. <laughs> I was um, born and raised in an interfaith family. I was bat mitzvah, but Judaism was not at the front forefront of my of my life. And um, but I've spent the better part of my career working in the Jewish community, almost 15 years. And there are many times in which I have felt like an imposter. Mm. And your book has really helped me to navigate that in a lot of ways. So my question for you is, what are you hoping that people think, feel, and do after reading this book? Oh, I love this question. So I, you know, I actually, as you were saying this, this actually made me think of, um, you know, when people ask me, how has my life changed? And I sometimes I'll say, well, I'm more observant now. And they'll say, like, they'll look confused. It's like, no, you're not, right? You don't go to a synagogue regularly. You're not Shomer Shabbos. You don't rigorously observe Shabbat. You, you don't keep kosher beyond not eating pork or shellfish. And I, I, I just want to gently push back on that because I, you know, the last I checked, there were 613 mitzvot, um, the, you know, sort of core Jewish laws. And those three definitions of observance certainly get to speak to some of those mitzvot, but you know, I'm wondering why you didn't ask me whether I conduct my business affairs honestly, whether I speak kindly, how much of my income I give to tzedakah, right? So I, I you know, I am more observant, but I, I think there, there are a lot of needs to vote. And I think in some ways, we're all kind of picking and choosing, right? And, you know, even the most rigorous among us are weighting some things differently than others. So I think that kind of opening up that idea of what it means to be a committed, passionate, you know, seeking thriving Jew, I think it's very diverse. So I, I really want to open up that idea. And I think that really gets to your, your imposter syndrome idea, which is, I still feel like an imposter so much of the time, right? Because I didn't, because I think I didn't grow up with a lot of the, the traditional Jewish stuff. I, I feel like I'm about to get it wrong. You know, whether I'm at a service or at a Shabbat dinner, I feel like I'm just always on the verge of breaking some rule. I'm always kind of looking at people around me, making sure I'm not going to screw it up. And Shabbat dinners, whenever they do benching, which is the grace after meals, the prayers after meals, I always feel like, oh, busted. Now they're going to know I'm just, I'm not that, I'm not a good Jew, which is sort of heart, it's sort of heartbreaking that we, we hold these things because there aren't, as far as I'm concerned, the whole good Jew, bad Jew thing doesn't mean a lot to me. I think there are Jews who have gotten the chance to be exposed to a really meaningful, powerful Judaism that resonates with them and Jews who haven't. So I don't, other category divides I don't really relate to. Um, in terms of your, your question about what we want, I want readers to think, feel, and do, I want readers to read my book and think, oh my gosh, there is so much in Judaism for me, right? There's just so much here that I had no idea about. In terms of what I want them to feel, I want them to feel moved. I want them to feel inspired. I want them to feel excited. I want them to feel challenged, like a little bit, a little bit kind of shaken up. Right? Because I think that's what Judaism has done for me, and it's been very powerful. And finally, in terms of what I want them to do, I really want people to engage deeply in whatever way makes sense for them. So I actually, I have an appendix of resources in the back of my book, which is additional books, experiences, websites, just what it, however it is that you learn about Judaism, that's really what I, that's really what I want you to do. I want people to learn deeply because I think that the biggest problem we face today is Jewish literacy. And that's such a, that's like an unsexy term, but I can just tell you from my personal experience that without basic literacy, without knowing really what the Torah was, without ever having heard of the Talmud, you know, Judaism to me was sort of like warm and vaguely nostalgic and like fine, right? Cultural Jew, Jew by heritage, that's fine. But it never was really particularly meaningful because I think that to find meaning in Judaism, you do need that basic literacy. You do need just those basic fundamental contours. So then you can dive in and, and find meaning wherever for you is the best place to look. Maybe it's in 
creating amazing Shabbats. Maybe it's in really powerful holiday or life cycle celebrations. Maybe it's in studying Jewish ethics. Maybe it's in trying some real spiritual experience through meditation or, or prayer or whatever. But I think having that grounding is what allows you to really engage deeply. So I'm, I'm hoping that people will take my book as inspiration to kind of get some basic Jewish literacy. So I, I recommend some other intro sources in the back of my book. And then to really dive deeply into whatever about Judaism calls to them. Thank you. I feel like we could go on and on, but we want to also give folks on the call an opportunity to engage with each other. So we are going to move into small group discussions. And when we come back, we're going to switch gears and talk about how the book applies to, to your work, um, the work of the folks on the call. And then I have to announce at the end of the call, um, two lucky winners will win a set of 10 copies of Here All Along that you can use um, for your book club or at your organizations with members of your community. So Erica will give some instructions for the breakout and then we'll see you back here soon. Amazing. Um, I also, I feel like we could just, there's so much there in what you already <laughs> did, said, I want to <laughs> dive in. Um, for those of you who haven't um, experienced the magic of Zoom breakout rooms yet, it's really exciting. Um, now is a great moment if you haven't yet turned on your camera and you can do so, now is a great time to do it. You're going to be taken um, magically to a smaller group of just three or four people. Um, CJP, William Davidson, JCC Association, I left you in your own rooms because you are with a group already and it's a little hard for individuals and conference rooms to interact. Um, if somebody, if I missed one and you're in a conference room and you need some help, you can sort of flag me um, and I can come chat with you. But in a moment, you're going to be invited to a room. Go ahead and take about 10 minutes in those rooms. Um, I'm putting in the chat right now um, a prompt for what you should spend those 10 minutes on. Start by introducing yourself. And then there's three questions there to respond to. And some of you have already started putting questions either to me privately or in the chat for everyone. Here's a link to put um, to put those questions, either ones that come up in your breakout room or ones that you've already been been thinking of. All right, so here we go, and we'll see you back here in about ten minutes. Hi there, those of you who are back in another 30 seconds, everybody else will also be back. If you have questions for Sarah and you haven't yet put them um, in our Google for, in our Google Sheet, please do. We have about 20 seconds. All right, I think that we are all back. Um, great, we hope that you enjoyed that time. I know with this many people in um, breakout rooms, sometimes there's gonna be one or two who end up without being able to really chat. So I hope that was kept to a minimum. Um, if you have questions for Sarah that you have not yet put in that Google Doc, please feel free to put them that, there now. I'll put the link in the chat one more time so that everybody has access to it. Great. Um, great, want, here we go. Dive into some of these really rich questions. Yeah. Um, Sarah, let's start, with, let's start with a small one. Why does being uh -huh. Jewish matter? <laughs> oh, that little, that little nothing question, no problem. I love this question because I, I actually think it's like, you're probably the most important question we can ask. And I think oftentimes these answers we've given are not maybe the most compelling answers, like the answer of like, because they always try to kill us and we have to survive or because, you know, Bubby would feel bad or guilt or the Holocaust, like those, you know, I think there's something to all of those, but I don't think that those are the, the best answers. I think for my perspective, the best answer is because Judaism has a tremendous amount of wisdom to offer to us and the entire world about what it means to be human, about how to be a good person, about how to live a meaningful, rich, connected, and powerful life, and about how to find deep spiritual connection. I, mean, I think the reality is that we don't sit around the office water cooler being like, 
hey, Jane, what do you think of God? Or like, hey, Bob, you know, how do you find community? Or like, what does it mean to be a good person, right? Like the secular world, I think, offers very thin answers to our biggest life questions. They're often, frankly, just market-driven answers, right? It's like, oh, are you, you're having this problem? Buy this product, consume this service, you know, do this thing. You're, you're not enough, you're not enough. Here's how you have to be better. And I think that Judaism's answers are just, they're really powerful and they're deep and they're rich. And I think that a lot of people right now are feeling this sense of disconnection, of loneliness, of isolation, I think of, of moral ungrounding. And I think that Judaism has just so much to say to us about all of that. Um, and so I think, you know, it has a lot to offer the world. And I, I once read somewhere, I forget who wrote it, this phrase, but this rabbi was talking about the, the um, how there's like an, an ecosystem of world religions and each of them has something to offer. And I think that if any, he said, you know, if any of them dies out, it kind of disrupts the balance of the whole ecosystem. And I, you know, I wouldn't take that too literally, but I think what he's saying is that we all have some real deep crowdsourced tested and vetted moral wisdom to offer the world. And I, I think Judaism does. And it's important for us to dive into that and to share it with each other and, and with the rest of the world as well. What was it about the intro to Judaism class that made you feel welcomed? And how is that yeah. different from what you grew up with? Yeah, so it's funny. A lot of people are like, oh, tell me about that class. Like, can we scale it? Can we send that teacher around the country and just replicate it? And the truth is, it was just, it was a pretty standard class. You know, it, there wasn't something specific about the class that lit my mind on fire. But I think that, you know, what was powerful about that class and about a lot of my most important experiences was that there was no assumption of knowledge, right? There was a very self-conscious kind of, you know, out in the room thing of like, we're all here to learn, right? Like we don't assume anyone knows anything in particular, things were explained. And this is what I try to do when I'm speaking to diverse Jewish audiences. If I, you know, if I use a Hebrew or Yiddish word or I refer to something, I'll do a quick definition. So when I said earlier, you know, when you're at a Shabbat dinner and, and it's time for benching, I then define that term. And I think that that is just so helpful. I also think that, you know, a lot, I remember once talking to a rabbi when I was first starting to learn and saying, you know, I would never send a Jew like me just to a, a Shabbat service. Right, that, that just would be a really tough introduction. And he said, well, but what if it was a really beautiful service? I was like, wow, I don't, I don't think you're getting it, right? Like when you're in that service, the assumption is, you know what's up here, right? You, you know what we're doing, you can participate, you can go along because there's not gonna be explanation in that service. No one is gonna stop and say, okay, you see people bowing now, here's why they're doing it, here's what it means. You don't have to do it if you don't want to, that's not what, you know, there's just an assumption of like, oh, we're doing this thing together. And I think that spaces where there's an assumption of we're doing this thing together often rely on everyone in that room having the knowledge and the comfort with that thing that we're doing together. And you know, sometimes that's the case. And I'm certainly not saying, oh, stop doing those experiences because two people in the room don't get it, right? That, that's not at all what I'm saying. But I am saying if you're gonna have that, that dinner, that, that Shabbat dinner, that service, that whatever, can you create a space half an hour beforehand where you say, hey, we're doing the Shabbat dinner, this service, come, come a little early if this is something that you're not familiar with or if you want a refresher and we're gonna actually go step by step through everything that's gonna happen. You know, first at this, you know, through the prayers we're gonna say, through the rituals we're gonna perform and we're gonna explain to you, you know, what, what do these mean? Why are we doing them? We're gonna practice them together. We're gonna, you know, I'm gonna explain that none of them are mandatory, right? These are all things we choose to do. And I think that makes sure it's important to kind of level set the room. So I think that that was really helpful to me in that class. There was kind of a, it was already level set, but I think in many experiences that I've had, it's just so helpful to give people a chance who don't, who aren't familiar with the, whatever's happening to get a little refresher first, or frankly, just the basic information first. How has your practice evolved since publishing the book? Yeah, you know, it's really funny. Like, I think, like I said before, people really, you know, the assumption is oftentimes that I am someone who's become very traditionally observant, right? That's just the, that's sort of the model, which is like, like you know, nothing about Judaism, you learn about it, and then you become orthodox, right? There, there's, that's kind of the, the assumption. And, you know, that isn't the case with me. My observance, you know, how has it changed? You know, I now have mezuzahs on my door, because that's just really, that's important to me. Um, I 
still continue to attend High Holy Day services and an occasional Shabbat service. The Shabbat service is new. Um, I now go to regular Shabbat dinners every probably three or four weeks with a, a group of friends, and that's a very big part of my life. That was not something I had ever done before. But I think having learned about the power and the magic of Shabbat, uh, I've done that. I don't have a really rigorous Shabbat practice beyond that, although I think that that's, you know, that is certainly an important practice. I, I did one experiment when I was in the White House with a kind of pretty traditional Shabbat observance where I, re I went offline, I didn't drive, I didn't, you know, I tried not to use appliances or screens, and I found that to be very powerful at the time. I also found it to be a little challenging because, you know, I, I'm not married, I don't have kids, and I think that oftentimes when you're doing that, if you're not doing it with family or if you're not kind of in a tight-knit community, it can be a little bit lonely, right? If no one else around you is doing it, I think it can be pretty challenging. So I I didn't continue it, but I, I really see the power and the, the magic of it. Um, I think a lot of my practice now consists of studying, which is a, a mitzvah. It's one of the, you know, the core Jewish laws, commands. Um, it's just, that is, I think what is so, I think that's what most moves me. And I, I really, really dislike it when people say to me, oh, well, you just have this very intellectual Judaism. I mean, you and you're studying. I find that, or they'll say, and they'll say, you know, normal Jews don't want to do anything like that. I find that to be so condescending and, and disrespectful to Jews as a whole. You know, I, I look around at the audiences that I, I speak with, and these are folks who, you know, pretty much all of them graduated from high school. Many of them continued their education beyond high school to become teachers, nurses, lawyers, salespeople, you know, a diversity of jobs, all of which involves some additional learning, vocational training, degrees, right? The idea that, that Jews don't like learning or that it's too hard for them, I, I don't think that's true, right? You know, most Jews I know read books. So I, this idea that like studying is, Jewish study is somehow an intellectual endeavor, I, I just, I so deeply reject that. I think that for me, Jewish study, it's very emotional. It's very personal and spiritual. You know, when I'm studying the words of our ancestors about how to live a worthy life and how to be a good person, I'm very moved by them. I'm often very challenged and angered by them too, right? This is a, I'm part of a conversation. This is something that is, it's, it's really moving to me. And so I think that, you know, I think that's a big part of my, my observance. It's a big part of my spirituality. And I wish it were something that we could bring to more Jews. I think that when we give people the impression that Judaism is, you know, three or four holidays a year and nothing else, um, I don't think we should be shocked when they go elsewhere, right? When they go to Buddhism or Burning Man or ayahuasca or yoga or CrossFit, right? I think, I think people are smart and they're thoughtful and they have big life questions. They have spiritual yearnings. And if we're not going to offer them some place to, to kind of slake that thirst in Judaism, it's not shocking that they go elsewhere. But fortunately, we have so much here. I think we have everything that folks are looking for in Judaism the challenge is how to translate it and it is hard. So I, I, I really, uh, I, I don't have, I, I don't have advice or criticism or things like that. Like it's something I'm really struggling with too. And I know all of us are. Mm. I just have to share with you when I got to the part of the book where you talked about starting to observe Shabbat while you were at the white house and going offline. I'm like, none of us have an excuse if you didn't have <laughs> at the white house. <laughs> it was, I mean, Jack Lou, who is a, he was an Orthodox Jew. He was the White House chief of staff and he observed Shabbat, right? Like, I, I mean, my schedule was nothing compared to the White House and he was Ch treasury secretary, right? If he can do it, then I know I definitely, I don't have an excuse. Yeah. Totally yeah. fair. Um, so speaking of the White House, I mean, a lot of people on this call want to know, like, what's your engagement with politics these days? And in particular, yeah. what did you think of the debate performance? <laughs> So I'm, I'm not working in politics now. I'm basically traveling full time to promote my book because it's, it's really important to me. And I love, it has been such a joy to engage with all these different Jewish communities. I've learned a tremendous amount. As for the debate, you know, I, I did watch the last two. Um, you know, I just don't love the debate format. I think the problem is that folks are given very small amounts of time. And in order to use that time wisely, what you do in debate prep is you practice answers, right? You kind of learn to give a 60 second answer and it, it can be kind of packaged. And I think sometimes what you see in the debates, which I find kind of off-putting is you see someone gets a chance to talk and they're like, okay, 
here's my 60 second answer, which may or may not be responsive to the question. And it sounds a little canned. So I actually felt a number of times the last night, I felt myself kind of tuning out when it was like, you know, I, there was one moment where someone was asked about, you know, that the question at the end about like, what's your life motto? And I think it was Amy Klobuchar, not no criticism meant to her specifically, but just as an example of something that everyone was doing, you know, she answered the motto thing and then she launched into her, one of her 60 second prepared answers. And I thought the motto part of the answer was really moving. And I, and I, was, I was with her because it was fresh and she was just doing it. And then came the kind of canned answer that she was getting out. And I thought that was sort of tough. I just also think that like, you know, you gotta really, for moderators, you have to be incredibly aggressive and loud as a moderator and really kind of shout people down because these candidates are aggressive and they're trying to get as much time as possible. And I'm going to draw a bigger lesson for Jewish educators. I'm gonna be really honest and I, I, I say this with love, but I largely stopped attending adult Jewish education experiences a couple of years ago because I found it really painful. You know, I, I somewhat, what would happen is some amazing educator or rabbi would come to speak and, you know, she's written 17 books on this topic and I'm so excited to hear about the topic. And I just think like, this is the woman who has so much to say about this. And instead I wind up listening for 45 minutes to Bernie in the back, talk about the Holocaust or Bernice in the front, give a speech about Israel. And they're just, you know, it's like not very substantive. You know, I, I think we're at a moment in time where so many Jews like me six years ago know very little about Judaism. And I think what we really need is a, a massive effort to give them substance, to give them learning. And I don't think having a thing that's like 15 minutes of learning and substance and then 45 minutes of just random people kind of sharing their random thoughts and feelings, I, I think that that kind of pedagogy, I find it a little bit frustrating. There's certainly a space for that kind of discussion-based class. I'm not against it, but I, I do think we need to kind of lean more on substance and just be really aggressive with folks who, you know, the 10% of folks in any context who kind of hold the re the, the other 90% of us hostage, I, I think we need to be more aggressive with those folks and be like, you know, Bernie, Bernice, thank you so much for that comment. I appreciate it, but let's get back to the focus of this class and we can talk afterwards. I think that's really important. There are so many um, great questions on this Google Doc. I wish we could get to them all. I think we have about time for one more before we close with a few final questions. And one that I'm curious about is, what to what extent did you interact with other um, faith communities and mm. their own lack of literacy, and how did that come up, if at all, in your in your writing of the book? Ah, oh, a great question. So I didn't I didn't do a lot of formal interaction with other communities, with other faith communities, um, and that's something that I really that I want to remedy because I think it's really important to learn about all the world's religious traditions. I think they all have something to offer. So I've actually just been doing some studying on my own of that. But I, I have engaged with individuals of different faiths. and I find it really powerful, um, especially my, my Christian friends, the way that they talk about the divine and God, it is so, for them, it's, it's so easy, it's so natural. There's something very effortless about it, right? They're very comfortable talking about God and the divine. And that's not something we do a lot of in Judaism. And I think that's a big mistake. Like, I just, I just think that's a, a real mistake. You know, I think that this is something that it's, I get why we are uncomfortable with it because we know people have different experiences, different comfort levels. We don't want to offend or upset anyone, but I think avoiding it isn't the way to do it. I think that actually saying to people, look, we have a lot of different divine conceptions in Judaism and maybe one of them or more of them speak to you or maybe none does, that's okay. But just putting it out there, I think is helpful. And I, even though I don't necessarily share my, I don't share my Christian friends' various theologies or understandings of the divine, a lot of it feels moving to me. Um, I've recently read a, a wonderful book by a pastor, a Lutheran pastor called, uh, named Nadia Bowles Weber. And I found a lot of her writing very, very moving and resonant, even if I don't necessarily share her theology. So I, I'd like to do more of that kind of interfaith exchange. Mm. I mentioned a little bit earlier on the call that I've spent um, just about 15 years working in the Jewish community and we get like stuck in a certain mindset. So my, my next question is what kind of reframe do professionals need? So I think the biggest thing, and I, I say this with such passion and fierceness is like, I hear so many rabbis and Jewish educators, especially Hebrew school teachers telling me, Oh, we're failing. It's just, we're doing a bad job. And I, totally disagree with that, right? I, I think that we put so much on our Jewish educators and are so critical of them. And I think that reflects actually 
a bigger problem, which is that so many of us, you know, we stop learning after our bar bat mitzvah. And then 20 years later, we have kids and we're like, well, someone's got to make this kid Jewish. Ain't going to be me. I don't know anything. Hey, Hebrew school teacher, it's your responsibility to transmit 4,000 years of culture, ethics, theology, holidays, life cycle, rituals, languages, blah, 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 to my kid and teach them Hebrew and get them bar bat mitzvah peace. Um, that's not fair, right? You, you can't dump the entire project of making a child Jewish on a Jewish educator or a rabbi. That's unfair, right? Like, I think that we have to take it upon ourselves to actually become literate, right? And that could be, that can involve reading a book, reading a few books, taking a class, however, however you learn, I don't you know, I defer to you, but I think that we have to become adult Jews. And I think that, you know, making educators and rabbis feel badly or like they're failing, that's not fair, right? I think that we as Jews have to start taking it upon ourselves to engage and to learn. So I, I want to reframe of Jewish educators and rabbis not feeling the sense of like shame or failure, but feeling like, okay, you know what? We gotta, we have to find a way to inspire people to take responsibility, to be partners with us in this work. So I just, you know, I just want to give the hugest shout out to educators and Jewish professionals and rabbis who are doing this work every day. It is not easy, especially in this time. I just, I respect you and I honor you. And I, I want that reframe of feeling of pride. I want you to feel pride and, and joy in what you're doing because it's, it's amazing and you deserve a lot more credit and support. My last question is, how do you recommend using this book as a tool? Yeah, so, you know, I really wrote my book to be the kind of book that someone who knows absolutely nothing about Judaism can sit down and read and it's totally inviting for them, right? All terms are defined, it's, it's accessible, it doesn't assume, you know, assumes no knowledge, it doesn't make them feel judged or shamed or embarrassed. And I also want an Orthodox rabbi to sit down with my book and learn something, right? Or, or be engaged or be sort of challenged or, you know, get something out of it. And so I, there's a couple ways you can use it. You know, one way is I know some folks, educators and rabbis have said, told me that they're using it as a text for an intro class. And to be helpful in that endeavor, I actually created an, an online discussion guide, actually two of them. They're on my website, which is just sarahherwitz.net. Again, just sarahherwitz.net, just my name and net. And one of them is for a one session class. Like if you just want to have a one session book group or something like that. But the other one of them is actually for, I think it's for like a 10 or 11 sec session class. So it has basically a different group of questions for each chapter and you can do one chapter a week. And the questions are designed to really get people to wrestle personally with the topics raised in the book, to really think like, how does this apply to me? How does this hit me? To really kind of dive deep into the, the substance of the book. So you can use it as a class. I think another way to use it is just, you know, I wanted, when I first started writing the book, I did a survey of about a dozen rabbis and I said, okay, someone comes to you, they know nothing about Judaism, they want to learn, what book do you recommend? And I got a lot of blank stares. I got a lot of kind of suggestions that struck me as a little random or not quite appropriate for a beginner. Like so one person recommended Heschel's The Sabbath, which is an extraordinary book, but maybe not the best first book. So I actually wanted my book to be an answer to that question, where like if someone comes to you, they're like, I know nothing, it just, I wanna read one book. I would love for my book to be that one book because it's not, you know, in addition to the book itself, there is that appendix of resources. Those, there are those discussion and study guides on the website. So it's kind of a, it's a good intro, but then it leads them to more explanation. So I think those are various ways that you can use the book. Thank you so much. This has been such a gift to be able to spend this Thank hour you. learning from you. Thank you for writing the book Thank and sharing you. it with them and for, for, to the JPRO team for creating this space for us. Thank you so much. This Absolutely. has been a total joy. And thank you all for joining. Really, I really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, this has really been a joy for us. Like, as an honor, it feels like, um, to JPRO to host. Um, and before you all sign off, um, as Abby mentioned, we are so lucky to the generosity um, of the Schusterman Foundation. We have, ten, we have two sets of 10 copies of the book to give out to now determined winners <laughs> um, <laughs> that you can use in your organization or with your book club or... Um, in your community in whatever way. So um, I'll tell you now that I see there's more than one of you, but the folks whose, whose name says you are J Camp George, um, if you are interested, we'd be, they actually got to <laughs> <laughs> stay on for a second so I can get your address. And also Julie Brodsky, a set for you if you 
I do get a book. Yay. You get a book. Um, so we'll be in touch so we can send those to you, courtesy of Payroll Network. Um, and for all of you, we're so delighted that you joined us today. Um, we, we did record the session, and we're going to send you a follow-up email thanking you for joining us, giving you access to the recording if you want to look back um, or share with any colleagues. And we'll include a link to those discussion guides that Sarah mentioned um, and to some more of JPROS programming in case you're interested in getting more involved with us. Again, deep, deep thanks to both you, Sarah, and Abby for taking the time and spending it with us today. This has been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. This has been a joy. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Have a 